Should we just start? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, so there will be a bombardment of links and slides and colors. So if you want to avoid kind of flashing into your face, oh, this is me. Hold on. This is the URL. <laughs> So you could download all the slides or just point your fancy camera probably at the screen and if you have QR code reader, you'll get that URL, you click on it and then you'll get a uh, full copy of the slides for your own use. And this is me. And on my overarching goal here for today or kind of primarily what I'm doing recently is to make a neuroscience a better science without doing much of science, kind of. <laughs> because I'm working on developing platforms and solutions and unfortunately not that much time left to actually do cool stuff. Um, so to put umbrella above all our projects, we, we organize this Center for Open Neuroscience, which is a my tiny room in that corner of this building. So if you want to talk, uh, please go to 415, I believe. And what we provide from the center is the open software platforms, frameworks, data, methodologies, all kinds of goodness. And the basic principles are that everything should be open source, right? Because that's the only way pretty much how it, science should operate, right? We should be freely exchanging, delivering as much as we could of um, objects of our pro uh, kind of scientific work, right? And another aspect is reuse and integration. So instead of coming up with new round or square wheel, uh, we are trying to reuse as much as possible from other projects and integrate them together so to deliver something bigger and better. But again, without trying to redo things which other people do and maybe do it better, right? And another aspect is dissemination. There is so much great stuff now in the field. Our open neuro, kind of neuroimaging was open from the beginning, right? We were lucky to have good a goodish data standard, nifty, right? We all use it. We, have you ever talked to electrophysiology people? You know, they're doomed, right? Every manufacturer has the, their own format, right? And they cannot even exchange the data files because they're all different formats. So collaboration is much more difficult. I'm not talking about software. In your imaging, kind of slowly, it's all built up on open source tools. Even SPM, although it uses MATLAB, right, underneath, it was open source. AFNI is there, it doesn't even have a copyright because it's owned by government, right? So it's all in public domain, their work. So everything was kind of always open and nice in our field. And that's why it's blooming with the tools, but sometimes you don't even know what is out there. So we are trying to just educate people actually what is there so you uh, could use them efficiently. And um, if you want to know more about our projects, you could go to Center for Open Your Science and there is uh, projects web page and we have two papers which we can I'll I'll mention around and one of them is four aspects uh, how to make the science open by design and I'll accentuate on that through the talk and another one is about one of our projects uh, NeuroDebian but it's not me alone who is doing it and one of my uh, great colleagues is Michael Hanke who is in Germany and who was postdoc here for two years, and that's where many things kind of uh, erupted, I would say, in this department. Um, but also we collaborate with Joey Hess, and he might be known by some of you as the guy who pretty much established half of the um, Debian project infrastructure at some point. So he's really great coder, and we collaborate with him on Gitanix. So he's the author of Gitanix, about which you've heard already and you'll hear more. But also other people work uh, with us, like Kyle works on data lab management projects. Then we have Benjamin Alex uh, working in Germany. We had interns and Jason is somewhere working around. So he was working uh, with us on data lab project. But also besides that, um, although I will not talk about these guys whom you know already, right? but they are pushing more and more goodness of open science in department and beyond. Um, and again, it's not just work of us, but we work with many of those projects. Some of our work is supported through NSF and NIH and Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany. So there is some funding, but as always, it's not enough. Uh, and many other projects are out there and they are doing a great job. So, Open by Design 101. I will not, th there was recently a report how to make science open by design. It was like 200 pages. 
and you need to log in to the some kind of distribution network, then you could get it. I haven't seen it yet. So I'll just give you two sentences, how you could kind of make it open by design. And first one would be prepare to share even if you might not share. So making it open doesn't mean that immediately you should just release everything to everybody, right? No, not necessarily. You just need to be ready to make it open fully or partially later on. Maybe it will be open to yourself. Because if you leave, that, that's one of the aspects, if you read that paper, four aspects, um, how to make science open by design, ownership might be owned by your employee, employer. And whatever product you've done, if you didn't manage to release it open source while you were employed, might not be available to you later on. And in your image, and actually, well, let's say if you do some wet lab, right, usually you have lots of equipment which you need to drag behind you, right? In your image, and again, what do we deal? We deal with scanners, right? Those we don't drag together. But we have lots of knowledge produced and lots of data collected. So if we could make all that knowledge and data kind of go with us, that would be useful, right? You move from one employer to another, but you take all your stuff, right? And one aspect there is use instead of disregard legal mechanisms. They're actually there to help us. So if you make it open source, right, license, then you're allowed to use it later on. And nobody could kind of, it might not be yours even, but you're allowed to use it, which is great. And now it kind of, there is this mentality, oh, those publishers are evil, they are not releasing our works. But it was kind of us who surrendered our rights to the publishers. So we should be better educated. We shouldn't publish and surrender our rights because it's our conscious decision, publish in a fancy journal, work we give all the ownership to the journal, right? It's not like they're stealing from us, right? It's our decision. So we should just be better educated. We know better now that if we want to use our materials later on in our own works, let's say in massive online courses, there are known cases where publishers would go and, oh, no, we own this figure now. You cannot use it. So it's, again, it's up to us to make it open. And another big aspect is invest your time at the beginning not at the end. That's why it's open by design. So, and that's where the aspects will go through. Sometimes this learning curve, if you invest at the beginning instead of just, oh yeah, I'll just do it tomorrow, 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 and then you never do it, right? You better invest this one or two days to start using the technology, which apparently everybody says it's useful, like GitHub, all those. You might save yourself lots of time in the future. And uh, so keep learning new, tools, frameworks, whatever you learn during this week, try to solidify it, try to use it after you've learned about it, try to use it in your research and share that knowledge with others because by training somebody, you're becoming a better expert yourself because you discover all those kind of nuisances. And again, do not reinvent the wheel, use and contribute to existing projects. Contribution to an existing project is a great way to learn. Instead of trying to figure out how things work, you get educated or mentored by those authors of the project, right? So you contribute some code, they say, no, 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 you should put this, this, and that. So they sometimes guide you. They usually have good testing frameworks to which you contribute and you benefit, you learn them, right? Uh, and then automate and script whenever possible. So if you are doing something over and over again manually, it means that you're doing something wrong. You should try to automate it somehow because then later on if you discover that you've made a mistake or somebody made a mistake or data changed and data was buggy you just could redo the same thing and Luke uh, ma ma mentioned my pipe right that's one of those kind of big frameworky automation things learning curve is like that right so it's like you know nothing until you know kind of okay now I figured out how it works and I use it and it's in the base who heard about fMRI prep or MRI QC, right? FMRI prep uses NiPipe underneath. So you could create bigger something which uses NiPipe inside and you don't even know that there is this nasty beast kind of lives in there. Okay, so open by design, we know the principles now. So what should we start with kind of thinking ahead of time for our studies? And the first one, problem for open sharing awaits from the beginning, right? Your image and data must not be shared without explicit consent from participants. So we didn't even start collecting the data. We should make sure that we could later share the data. Maybe with ourselves, right, or other researchers. And it's not anecdotal kind of, you know, evidence. It happens that people from 
well-respected labs and sharing data, right? They might need to take data back offline and go back to IRB committee and it might take half a year or a year to get clearance to actually get that data shared. So it's much easier, you just provision it from the beginning, you don't need to waste another you know, year to wait for it to be shared. And I'm not talking about paying that guy, let's say, enjoy it, uh, Fur Furkan Hosselik, right? So you, maybe you decided to do your PhD project on this cool data, you know you'll do it and then it disappears, right? So it's not good. And that happens also with the software. So this patent or copyright or license, it's an aspect which shouldn't be disregarded because things might disappear from online if they're not legally shared. So you trust Sci-Hub maybe for now, it might be gone at some point. So that is not a solution, it's a band-aid, right, to solve the problem, but proper solution is just respecting the copyright and trademark which we impose on our works, okay? Okay, so how do we do it? There is first project for you, open brain consent form. And if you want, if you have any artistic inclinations, please contribute the logo. We don't have any in the moment. And what it is about, uh, the, the problem kind of is strange, right? So we have federally regulated, uh, federal regulation for how data should be anonymized and how RB committees should allow or disallow access to the data, right? But we don't have actually centralized <laughs> regulation which we could just, or form which we could use. So all RB committees, they have their own ideas what data in, could be shared and how it should be anonymized. So that's the problem which we were trying to solve by first providing sample consent forms. So you could go online and click there and get uh, sample consent forms from which you could kind of figure out what wording you could use in your forms. Or now we have ultimate consent form contributed by Chris Gorgolevsky uh, from their experience with OpenFMRI project and at Stanford collection of data. So it's a little bit more elaborate, verbose uh, statement. And we have two forms of it. We have single access type where all the data is shared, well, given that it's anonymized data. And second is two access types. So whenever you share a portion of the data, but some other portion, which might be more sensitive, you keep it more restricted, okay? So pretty much we fulfill probably majority of the use cases we have in neuroimaging about data sharing. And now people started to contribute translations, like we have German, French, Chinese, Spanish, Italian. So if you know some other language, there we go, you know where to computer, contribute to. And also uh, we provide just a list of anonymization tools. So you could, from the beginning, provision that how you will anonymize your data, right? Uh, let's say defacing uh, is a common procedure. If you go to OpenFMRI, all the anatomicals will be defaced and you could do it easily. Okay, so get involved, start to use open brain consent form. If in your studies, nothing is provisioned about open data sharing or some kind of data sharing, you better provision it. So talk to your RIB, give them samples and put it uh, in, in, in your consent form so you don't need to go back. And um, submissions of translations, fixes, typos, everything is welcome. Again, spread the word, obviously. Okay, any questions on that topic? All clear, good, okay. So let's go, second problem. Huh. Yeah, so I, I looked at into, into data a lot, and one of the things I got the need for, for analysis is the highest uh, resolution image scanning for the patient's head. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a very large body of science. It's easier to get to that than anonymized data. So how do you deal with sharing such models? Well, that's a perfect question, I don't know. First of all, well, you still, you might not, well, you want a face for a good forward model, right? But usually you don't have electrodes here, so I'm not sure how much of effect would be if you deface, like just remove the nose, you know, obscure maybe facial features, and dental features probably wouldn't matter much unless it's, there is some feeling, <laughs> right? So you could probably release and sculpt, it is unique, as, way, as well as our gear folding, but how plausible all this kind of privacy, right? It's how plausible to identify a person if you know the bumps of the head, right? So most probably you could share the shape of the skull, right? So you will not share MRI image itself, but after you do uh, parcellation tessellation, you could share this portion, <laughs> which is used for electrodes, right? Maybe with removing facial features. That could be a solution, I think. Okay, so bits, who knows about bits? 
many people, but there is some people who didn't raise their hand. Okay, who doesn't know about bits? Okay, so there are some people. Um, bits is great, and this slide, so bits is not a problem. <laughs> it's red slide and bits is in the title. And this is a citation for the bits. So after Nifty was kind of standard which allowed us to communicate freely in neuro imaging, bits becomes a standard for how to communicate through whole data sets, right? So when you share the entire data set. But the problem is that maybe sometimes to prepare such a data set, okay, who uses bits? Ah, less people, see? So to prepare those data sets, sometimes it's a little bit more involved. And uh, that's why I want to present you a project which is called Reproin, or reproducible input. You could stare into the furthest. I, I will not try to zoom in here. I'm not sure this wrong. Uh, but what it does, it presents well, this is kind of symbolic. You take your DICOMs, which you cannot really understand what is going on, and you prepare them as a data set, which is where layout is clearly described and consistent across all the projects, right? So to some degree, that's, I think I've said it first, you have seen one bits data set, you have seen them all. In a sense that you could go to a new data set and you always know where things are and where should you look for detail, right? So it becomes really convenient. You need to struggle and contact the author, like, oh, where is the stimuli file? Where is the onsets? Uh, it's all the same. So, uh, and bits is not only human, but also it's machine friendly. So there are tools like PyBits in Python. It allows you to quickly get, like, give me all anatomicals, boom and you get a list of files for all anatomicals for your subjects, right? So you could create more efficient queries. And also there are bits apps. So it's applications which could understand this bits layout and do the rest for you. So you've collected your data, let's say it's in bits, you give it to fembry prep, you specify parameters, you have all your pre-processed data right away, right? So imagine you could get the bits data sets right away from the scanner. And that's what we are doing here. So our solution, Reprain, we started again investing in the beginning. We name all our sequences in the scanner consistently across all the uh, all the labs. Everybody who scans here, we use consistent naming, and then we use consistent hierarchy of the uh, they call them lacaos. No, I forgot how they call it Siemens. So it's like region, and then I forgotten the drop down levels, right? So we name them consistently, and from that, we just get a bunch of DICOMs, as everybody does, right? And we use a tool called Hudiconf, to which we contributed. Again, we decided not to reinvent, but to contribute to existing tool. And DataLab, I will talk about that one later, to get our bits data sets. And that is pretty much by running one command. Because we all use consistent naming, we could just run the command, it knows where to put that data set because we consistently allocate it on the left, you know, in the hierarchy of studies. And it's all under Git and Git Annex. So all the data under version control from the beginning, you could use your Git commands, let's say, to find where, al we don't know description for your study, we don't know whom we should acknowledge. It's all in there and you could quickly find what you need to change and change it. Because it's Git, we could keep add in more data and you could keep merging new data with your changes while your study is ongoing. So overall setup is we have a scanner, then we have text server, we have a server which does conversion, prepares those data-led data sets, we do it in singularity container so we have clear idea and consistency across uh, all the conversions, and then we use data-led to manage our data sets and uh, submit changes maybe, push them for analysis on, uh, on the cluster, and without losing control, where do I have those data files? Which versions did I analyze here or there? It's all under Git, so all the versions are clearly tracked. Uh, so benefits are, I think, good. You, you could ask those people who actually scanned anything in the center. Uh, it's really handy saver, time saver, so nobody manually creates bits data sets anymore here. And investment of time was not that big. Uh, and they're clearly organized, so now PI doesn't have to go and, oh, where is that data set? Who stored it somewhere? And I don't know where, right? Because all the hierarchy is clearly organized in the hard drive. And um, we extract lots of useful metadata from DICOMs, like slice order, 
echo time, all those parameters get recorded. And then we rely also on bits validator, which validates that our data set is fully compliant. And sometimes it catches some kind of intricacies. Let's say, oh, this subject didn't have second session. Oh, in this subject, you had different resolution from the rest of the subject. So even validation at the step right after conversion of data from bits is really helpful to catch early problems. And of course, all data is con uh, in data lab, so you could collaborate, share. Well, share not publicly. So data lab and Git doesn't demand you to share it publicly. But whenever you are ready to share, let's say you are published a paper, do you know how much you need to do now to share the data pretty much? You need to say data lab publish to here or export to fix share, kaboom, right? Because it's in bits, right? You modify it, your description, maybe you deface some anatomicals, and that's it. That's as much as you need to do. So again, by investing time in the beginning, we are hoping to make it easier to share the data later on. Okay, and uh, Reprain or Hudiconf is available also in, in your Debian, so that's another project you'll hear about later on. Any, oh no. Get involved, right? So first of all, first advice, collect DICOMs, not Pararex and Nifties. That was with our previous scanner, Philips, people collected Nifties. And then they lost all precious information about all kinds of stuff because DICOMs were gone. And use reprint on for new studies, or you could establish similar heuristics for already data which you've collected for Hudicon. Or maybe we could work together to establish kind of mapping from your naming convention into reprint conversion and convert it together. Uh, the everything is on GitHub. You're welcome to contribute. Spread the word. Any questions now about this stage? All good? So, uh huh? Uh, that was in uh, in brain open brain consent form part. So oh, okay. if you go there, there is a page which you could either anonymize DICOMs, which is it's a tough problem because you never know where manufacturer sticks his private fields, right? And ideally, you just don't put much of uh, private data inside the scanner. So in our case, we keep private data in a separate database. In the scanner, we just use subject ID, which is just a number, right? And uh, age uh, age seems to be okay. Uh, date of accession or when patient was accepted, that is a tricky one to HIPAA. And soon, well, it's already implemented in data lab, but we need to use it Hudicon. All the dates in the Git repository will be completely screwed up. So the time will start from, I forgotten, April 10, 2006, I believe. And who will uh, answer what the date is? I could give you exact date. Why that date? What happened on 2000? I'll check what, but uh, <laughs> it was somewhere in 2006, I think. It, it's important date. So all the dates will start from there and go incrementally with one second. That's how versions will be in that Git repository which will come from the scanner, really obfuscated because dates are sensitive information. But they are recorded in a series file which is in the Git repository under annex control which you don't have to share. So all the information will be preserved but not publicly exposed, let's put this. Okay, let's continue. Guess what color of the slide will be now? Red, again, we've got a problem, <laughs> right? So when I was young, or in 2007 and beyond, um, there were no standard software for data-driven analysis. Now all the data science boom and whatnot, right? Take it back 11 years ago. There was nothing, right? People published fancy papers, but code wasn't shared. You live in kind of utopian times now. There is so much data and code sharing as never before, right? Uh, so at that time, people started to publish fancy papers, Searchlight, MVPA, but there were no good code to actually share, right? So others could do the same things. So we started the MVPA project. And that's Princeton 2007, me, Jan on the right, Michael Hanke, Jan in the middle, and Per Soderberg, uh, who was stuck in Princeton that time. Now he's, I've forgotten even where. Uh, he was in Ohio, and then, huh? Virginia. Virginia, yeah, so he went south. Good. So at that time, we wanted, and that's Python 2007. I don't remember, it was 2.3 probably, or 2.2. So it was prehistoric times. Uh, what we wanted is user-centered programmability. So we could 
express ourselves really easily, what do you do for your analysis? We wanted good documentation. As soon as IPython was released, not it wasn't even released, but we had already notebooks with examples how to go through, uh, Pine, use PyMVPA. We wanted to be extensible. We didn't want to recode all the machine learning libraries, right? We wanted to stick our fingers in there. Again, reuse, integration instead of re-implementation. And wanted to be portable, so it runs everywhere. And by portable, I mean portable. Before we went to Dartmouth, <laughs> we found that it was used apparently at Dartmouth uh, and some cold season research lab where they put it on the robot somewhere in Arctic. I don't know why they needed PyMVPA for that, but <laughs> here we go. Um, and reliable. So there was already a few times today, maybe 10, you said word continuous integration, right? Testing. It's really important because you've heard probably buzzwords such as reproducibility. Reproducibility is good, but what is important is actually correctness, right? If you could reproduce the same incorrect behavior, it's only so much of value to it. So it's really important to make sure that your code, if you code, works correctly. And that was our, uh, one of our accents that all of the code should be unit tested. Well, we don't have 100% coverage, but we have quite good coverage, let's put it that way. And even if you're coding in MATLAB, you can do and should do testing of your code. Uh, there will be links later on. But in Python, we are blessed with uh, built-in unit testing plat platform. That's why Python code typically is unit tested because it just comes with the language. Now there is better tools which support it, but language came with the unit testing. And of course, it needs to be free and open source. So Python, you know, XKCD, right? And the, I, it's just tutorial. Now I'm giving tutorial on PyMVPA. We all know which, what we should do first. We need to import anti-gravity. So that's the first line in PyMVPA script. If you want to be a MATLAB user, where you just import everything to your namespace. You just import star. And I'll give you examples. Sorry, I jumped too much. This is the lines how we create a data set where we bind together uh, our neuroimaging data, maybe labels for the samples, and provide the brain mask and add some additional, we call them feature attributes. And what happens inside, we apply that mask, flatten all the data in just 2D metrics. So we have samples by features. This is what machine learning algorithms understand, right? But meanwhile, we are preserving important information such as voxel indices. So later on, we could do spatial uh, aware algorithms such as searchlight, where you care who is your neighbor, right? So we create this data set, which allows us also easy manipulation. We could say now, oh, give me some sub data set where it's ventral temporal cortex, right? So we could easily subselect portion of the data set without losing information where it's coming from. And we could get a summary. Oh, okay, in this case, we had you know, these categories, we had so many runs, and we could apply classifier. So if you are eager to do some MVPA style analysis, here you go. This is linear CSVMC, so it's flexible margin SVM. We put it into cross-validation with specifying how we partition the data, and we get our errors, and we just visualize them. Here we go. Well, this is a little bit different conditions now, it just paints your uh, table, or we could plot it if you want plotting. And all of that is pretty much achieved with this code. So you need that much code to get those results. But because we are doing neuroimaging, sometimes we want some fancier algorithms such as searchlight, right? And what is a searchlight is we are taking that cross-validation, right? Everybody knows, but I'll just repeat, right? So we're taking that cross-validation, we take some local neighborhood, and we do that cross-validation in just that neighborhood, and we put our estimate at that location of the neighborhood. And then we go to the next one, and to the next one, while we are filling up this map, right? So that's called search map. And how difficult to change our code? Not difficult at all. We just say that it's this cross-validation, we put it into spherical searchlight at radius three, and that's it, and we get our map. And then we could save that map back into Nifty, so we will unflatten it, put it into the same original location where it was, and we are done, we could use our um, favorite tool to visualize it, FNI or FSL, or we could also save it into HDF5 file for easier interoperability with PyMVPA itself. Um, okay, the same way you could apply it to EG, MEG, uh, we did it to uh, neural spike recordings, fMRI, but also across modalities, that was part of my PhD thesis, transfusion, I called it later transfusion, where we 
I've tried to predict um, fMRI signal from EEG signal. I will not tell you the horror stories and beautiful stories of that. That's a separate topic. Okay, so, and others apparently managed to use PyMVPA as well. We didn't update that page, and that's why you could contribute just to collect all the citations we have so far. But there is like uh, papers in really nice journals, although maybe not fully open, but still nice journals, right, which use PyMVPA, and apparently our work contributed to work of others. And we have reasonable tutorials you could use. And hold on. All oh, right, and if uh, that's not enough motivation, that's my old phone, OpenMoto, which was running Debian at that time, and it was running PyMVPA, so that was apparently convincing to some people, okay? So, who is PyMVPA for? Uh, it's for everybody who wants to do PyMVP, uh, MVPA, RSA, or hyperalignment. Hyperalignment is pretty much uniquely implemented in PyMVPA, so if you've heard the term hyperalignment, that's the tool to use and apply your new, uh, some new tools to your uh, neural data, conveniently compare your methods, and also benefit from established testing and distribution. In sense, instead, if you have some method you want to contribute to the community, right, it might be better to contribute it to PyMVPA. Then you'll benefit from our established testing platform, right, and you will not need to do with releases and distribution because we have it already established. Right, so it will be easy peasy for you, and then somebody needs just to uh, manage your code later on, right? Okay, so get involved, everything on GitHub, welcome contributions, sp spread the world, word. And also mention now there is new ribbon, you credit it. That will be another project I'll mention, if I have time. Okay, any questions on PyMVPA? No. <laughs> Okay, that would be unfair, uh, almost. Uh, due to the age of the beast, right? So we are slowly moving it, but not yet over there. Uh, well, you, you could use it, but the results are not guaranteed. So it's <laughs> not worse than many other toolkits which don't do the any kind of testing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not yet Yarik approved, yeah. But uh, it, it's, it's usable. If you want to contribute, that could be a cool hackathon project. That one, yeah. Okay, <laughs> more questions? No, okay, what color of the slide will be now? No, it's a ball test. Okay, we'll continue with this one. So, uh, apparently motivation is there, guys running on the cell phone, but the problem came here, right? And that was 2009 or 10, so it, things improved, but still. At that time, installation of Py, uh, PyMVPA was difficult. Now PIP is better, before it was mess. So, the problem was that installing all these kind of heterogeneous analysis environments, in our case, we depended on many libraries, it wasn't <laughs> trivial. Uh, so, and typically we don't use just one toolkit, right? I've already mentioned how many. I've mentioned what it was, UDConf, there is PyMVPA, right? Underneath they same, use some libraries. So usually we use many, actually, of the project. But how could we reliably install them? And that's another project which we uh, go with is NeuroDebian. Okay, who knows about NeuroDebian? Woohoo! Who uses NeuroDebian? Okay, who uses Ubuntu? Good, you, you're using NeuroDebian, you just don't know that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the problem is that no software is written by God. Even though if you look hard, there is nothing written by God. And uh, all software has bugs, right? And even data has bugs. So everything that has bugs, bugs are made by the God. But he doesn't write the programs. Okay, so most common research software is not rock solid. So it's buggy even more than commercial systems, right? Because it's too few users. This how we are not Microsoft. We cannot just release the product and then users, you know, test it, they report, and somebody fixes it, right? In our case, we didn't have that many users. We have just few, only on few platforms, and bug reporting is typically not easy, heterogeneous. You don't know where to go to report the bug, right? It's just easier to give up. Right? Or, uh, and also typically scientific programmers, they didn't come from professional software engineering background, right? So it's researchers who are eager to learn, right? Who need to learn and they code and then it just goes out of hand. Apparently they now master the project which is uh, used by hundreds or thousands. So they learn as they go. And then they graduate. They earn PhD, they move on, that's it. Now it's in the air, right? So many projects just die off 
who, who heard about Voxpo? Voxpo, Voxpo, who's old enough? Here we go, where is it now? The guy works for Google, right? So, well, it's not exactly a PhD phenomenon, but if you move on, project might die, right? So you need to involve people so they would continue. And it used to be at least that in many projects there were no uh, clear development uh, openly, right? Free Surfer, it was hidden somewhere in CVS, which nobody could clone because it was four gigabytes of, and it, no, not everybody had access. No bug tracker, right? So at least now it's much better with GitHub, but still. So it's broken by design kind of, right? So it's impossible to obtain funding for software development. Now there are some lines of funding which available still, it's not, not really the main line of funding out there. And it's not considered to be a scientific proce progress, right? So even though maybe hundreds of people use it or thousands, right? They contribute, right? But it's not the progress on its own. Uh, but we crave for new software, right? We want to be at frontiers. We want to use new methods, right? Um, we want to use bleeding edge um, kind of technology, right? But we don't want to lose results. So it's always kind of this trade-off, right? No money, but you may need it, right? We want latest one, but we want it stable. So we want too much. Okay, so it just makes, takes too much time to upgrade every day, right? So we cannot upgrade our computers every day. Uh, on Windows, people used to spend a lot of time, at least for non-research maintenance tasks. At least these smart people in 2011, we, they asked and that's what we were told. Uh, and upgrading was requ required lots of time, right? You had to download, extract, maybe configure again. So it just was pain. But it's uh, essential to disseminate these new, new features. So our vision was that we'll use, we'll create a platform which could be shared with anyone. Again, do you remember this copyright Nishiwoshi and licenses? That was one of the main aspects. That's how we actually got to talk to French people because they didn't release software for free. So we had to talk to all French people we know so they could talk to the French guy and convince him to convert the license because he didn't want to talk to us anymore. So it's a really exciting project. So we wanted to make sure that the tools which we use could actually be shared. But also we wanted to work on all devices, right? Uh, the same with PineVPA and thanks to Docker, Singularity, VirtualBox, we have it now, right? Linuxes, they, they work everywhere. Uh, that it's guaranteed to be available for as long as we want. It's kind of, again, this freely shareable, right? Even in Debian, which is the project which I'll talk shortly, where software goes through the scrutiny of checking license terms, even there, some software sometimes get kick, kicked out because some piece is found is not uh, shareable. Okay, so, and we want all software is available in a single environment. We don't want to install uh, get this one from CRAN, this one from there, this is from Node.js. So we wanted some system where everything, regardless of what it's implemented, it is available within the same interface. And so we could share everything and developers can focus their scarce resource in the sense that we don't duplicate the effort. So not everybody just wastes an hour to install stuff, but it's some poor soul which packages it, right? And then everybody benefits. Okay, so we decided to base it on Debian because we used it at that time, and Debian is the oldest and pretty much the only fully democratic uh, Linux distribution out there. It was never governed by any company, it's just volunteers from all around the globe and have been doing it already for 20 years is understatement, 30 years. No, no, 20, I'm not that old, okay, 20 years. Uh, and it's actually origin of the most uh, popular Linux distributions now. Ubuntu is based on Debian. Our work in Neuro Debian, we upload it to Debian, then it gets to Ubuntu. That's why Ubuntu users are Neuro Debian users, right? It's just they don't know it. Okay, so what we do, we adopt technology. Again, we don't come up with new derivative. We just integrate within Debian itself. We participate in Debian project and we benefit from work of all those thousands of other Debian developers. We called it NeuroDebian, stretched the logo a little bit, made it fancy, and here we go. This is NeuroDebian. Uh, if you want to know more, this is the publication about it. And what is NeuroDebian from a researcher's perspective? That you could install as easily, let's say editor, gedit, right? Which is schmuck, it's nothing, it's tiny. And FSL, which is like <laughs> bloated, right? Uh, big package, it doesn't matter. You just say, install me this. 
right? And it gets installed. Then you could install full swarms of packages. So let's say if you want to do psychophysics and want to get psychopy, uh, psych toolbox, what else do we have? PyPL. You just install this mega package, which just depends on all those small smaller packages. And then you could keep your entire system up to date, which is just upgraded between different releases. And there is support channels and new one neurostars.org. So if you, who knows about neurostars? Only a few people. So if you have a question, try to ask there first. It's a nice portal, it's modern, it's not like uh, IRC, it's, it, it looks good. Okay, so reproducibility. And this one, I've created this slide long before even Docker existed, I think. And the beauty was that even now, I believe, I can create environment from 2003. Docker didn't exist, so I can't create Docker image if it's that probably. But I could use just built-in technologies of Linux and create that environment with Python 1.5, talking about reproducibility. If I know what to install, I could get such an environment. But also, NeuroDebian is available through a variety of forms. If you use Ubuntu, you could enable our NeuroDebian apt repository by apt-get install NeuroDebian. Then we have Docker images with NeuroDebian pre-enabled. Then we have Singularity Mega Image, which installs all, already comes with lots of useful stuff for you. And there is a virtual machine, which we used extensively for teaching PyMVP and other toolkits. Okay, meanwhile, through the years, that's the kind of cloud of software which we integrated inside. You could see this is all primarily neuroimaging related. And we've got some great feedback from some people and not so great feedback from others. Again, development and maintenance of software is not considered, you know, really valuable. So they wanted some new method which nobody cares about and, you know, and that's in the same review panel. So one said that it's greatest thing and another one says, it's the worst thing, and then the middle ground is not what they find. Okay, but actual real users, they, they are quite thankful. And somehow all this NeuroDebian plus PyMVP became, for some, the environment which they use for their research. But underneath that work, the, all this packaging, we, we make sure, or try to make sure that uh, the tasks which you add to your software they pass on Debian system. And sometimes they fail, you know? But then we don't upload software which we know it's not yet fixed and not yet ready. So that's how we provide quality assurance. And sometimes we initiate testing. Let's say PsychoPy, that's how it was born. Uh, me imposing unit tests upon PsychoPy code. But now look at it, it's, it's fully tested, it's great. Right, the same I'm trying to do with Afni. Uh, so slowly but steadily. Uh, but also we mentor, so if you have some software where you want to be in Debian and you have some resources to learn Debian packaging, we could provide mentorship and sponsorship to upload to Debian. Um, there is virtual machine and then we talk with Debian. Okay, let me just move on. So NeuroDebian is pretty much for all of you. It's rock solid. It could be used for many things and maybe you're using it without knowing. So if you are using Docker, Right? Who uses Docker? Some people do. Most likely, those images for neuroscience research, they're based on NeuroDebian. Or maybe on the packages which we upload to Debian and it's based on Debian. Not necessarily, but quite often, let's put it this way. Okay, so get involved, spread your word, and uh, I will not open that page, but we still have third of the coffee cans which we've collected through the years. So if you want to build some artsy pile of coffee cans, uh, please do. It's in that room down the hall. Okay, so next problem. We talked about software, but what about data, right? So we have Git and GitHub for code development. We have NeuroDevon for distributing uh, software, but data is kind of second class citizen, right? Everybody just, oh yeah, we don't share. Yeah, we, we don't version control. Uh, but that was the problem. We couldn't share big data sets also through NeuroDevon because the mechanisms in Debian are not good fit for data. So data-led project was born. Although originally it was called data Git, but then all this trademarks issue and me being stupid talking to the lawyers, so they said no. Anyway, so why data-led? Tarballs are inefficient distribution format. That's how people typically distribute data, right? You go download the tarball. And then guess what? They new, make new release. And then you go, what? Redownload the new tarball. 
whenever maybe one file of one kilobyte changes. So those who dealt, let's say, with open fMRI portal, you might know that that's a common case, at least used to be. And absent versioning of data. Yeah, the data doesn't change. Data is data, right? No. Actually, derived or curated data does change, and quite often sometimes, right? And we all version it. We just don't version it efficiently, right? We just use words, we use dates, we just rename the files, but that's not the way. So we need to use versioning, and code version control systems are inadequate, right? You don't want to commit all your data into Git, right? Because then it just will take forever, and then you won't be able to push to GitHub. And we don't have data distributions. We don't have something like um, up get install this data set from fMRI, uh, open fMRI. And uh, we have cacophony of authentication schemes, right? For HCP data sets, you need to go get credentials, then you go click a bunch of buttons until you get to the data set, right? And let's talk about upgrades. You repeat this dance again, right? If you remember the sequence. Uh, and we don't have app data testing. Oh, who would need to test data, huh? That's stupid. No. Especially with derived data, or if you create an atlas, that's what happens. Uh, data can and have bugs. And it goes unnoticed for a while. And I will not tell the horror story. We don't have time. OK. Um, difficulty to share new or derived data. So all these problems we decided to solve with data let's go, right? So managing data should be as easy as managing code and software. And here we go, data-led website. It got facelift recently, so it should look neat and nice. And please visit. So foundation is one Git, and everybody knows about Git by now, right? So it's a version control system. I, I initially developed to manage Linux project code, if you didn't know. And uh, it's distributed in a sense that all the content which you commit into Git, it will be present in all clones of that repository, right? So if you commit a file, that file, later on, whenever people pull or fetch, it will, they will get their own copy. So if you commit one gigabyte file, huh, if you manage to, it will be distributed to all those copies. Just keep that in mind. And it's a backbone for GitHub and other social coding portals. It's very efficient for managing text information. Git is great. It's just awesome. But it's inefficient for storing data. Again, I just keep reiterating the same. Uh, but there is Git Annex. So Git Annex was built on top of Git. It provides access to data content from a variety of sources. So content itself is not committed into Git. Git only keeps information about where the data is available from. It might come from a variety of sources. And you could put it into a variety of sources. And Git only keeps information where it is available from, on which clone of yours. And it allows for custom extensions. So you could create an extension to, oh, I keep it on my server somewhere which has this fancy protocol which nobody else talks. So you could extend it to, uh, without limitations. And also it provides you Dropbox-like synchronization. You could use Git Annex Assistant and say, oh, monitor these clones of this repository and keep them in sync. So this one has only my music. This one has only videos. This one has everything. So you could establish this really heterogeneous backup across all your computers. It's really nice. But both Git and Git Annex largely work at the level of single, single repository level. That's problem one, right? So it, they're not distribution, right? So you use Git usually for one repository. And the same with Git Annex. But also that there are already terabytes of data sets out there, and we want just to provide easy access to them. And none of those tools don't do it kind of by default. Somebody has to do it. So that's how DataLed was born. And let me just walk you through through example. Let's say we have open fMRI. That's how it used to be, at least, that there was data somewhere in the three bucket, then somewhere in the tarballs. And what we do with DataLed, there is a command DataLed crawl, where we established monitoring on the ex of the external services and create Git Git Annex repositories from them. So those get compiled together into bigger packages, which we call super data sets. And then you could install them as your regular Git repository. There are regular Git repositories just with additional information inside of them. And you can install them with the data or without the data. So you could get maybe full structure where all the data files are replaced with broken symlinks. So they don't carry any data, but then you just say, give me this data file and it fetches it from wherever it's available from. 
then you could produce new data files and you could add them into the system. So we use data let add command, which is pretty much git annex add and then git commit. So it's two steps at once. And you could publish them somewhere. Let's say you could publish the repository itself on GitHub and the data files published to HTTP server you have given you by institution. And what the beauty of it, git annex keep track where data is available from. So whoever then clones this repository, he will be able to obtain the data file from wherever data file is available from. Either it would come from original OpenFMI or from your uh, university website where you publish your derived data. Git annex will know all of that. Okay, so what is data led? It's one plus two and they call three. It manages multiple repositories organized into super data sets so you could install all of OpenFMI data sets in one command and supports both Git and Git Annex repositories. So you could still use it with just Git without all this Annex fanciness. We could crawl external web sizes and you could crawl external web sizes. If you found the page with data files, you could establish yourself data let crawler and get those data files in Git Annex repository and monitory uh, for, for, for changes. And it's quite scalable since data stays with original data providers. We unify access to data regardless of its origin, so users don't care where it comes from. And we also aggregate metadata. So who knows, who, yeah, who knows what metadata is? Data about data. Exactly, it's data about data. Let's say you have a nifty file, it has already some metadata like resolution, right? That's metadata, it describes your data, right? It's at what resolution it was taken. But maybe for a data set, you could have, you know, uh, what is, oh, age of the participant, right? That's already metadata as well. So now in DataLed, we extract all kinds of metadata and make it uh, uh, possible to search through it. So you could find actual data files you're looking for. And then it could publish to uh, other websites or GitHub or Figshare and export, right? Here we go. But also it makes it easier to do so because we have all the information available. We have metadata, we have all the uh, location data available, and we, it comes with common line and Python interfaces. So whatever way you, you like. So at the moment we have from datasets.datalab.org, we provide around 12 terabytes of data, although locally hosted only 200 gigabytes for our studies. And we cover many of those known portals and even some uh, podcasts. That was one of my favorite podcasts, so I decided to crawl it and create QE sheets so I could quickly seek through the uh, podcast. It was, it was a nice project. Yeah, uh, so coming a human connect on project, XNet support, maybe integration with NeuroDebian, uh, Open Science Foundation, and integrations, we have Reprain, which I've mentioned that, oh, all the data sets coming out as data led data set. Here is one of the integrations, and Open Neuro is using data led and Git Annex now for their next release in the background. So all the data, data, data sets will be done through DataLed. Okay, so there is a website, dataled.org, which describes many of the features as those uh, nice ASCII arts. Let's say if you're interested in reproducible science, there is dataled run command, which is great. There is also dataled rerun command. So if you record your history of changes, then you could say uh, dataled rerun and it will take your entire Git history of you, whatever you've done and just tries to rerun it. So, and then you could check, did you get the same answer or not? Uh, so it's quite nice. Uh, so oh, oh, managing data can be as simple as managing founded software. Maybe a little bit more difficult, but still, it's almost as simple. So I'll give it a try. And just one last problem. So we've used already so much of, or I presented quite a bit of uh, toolkits, right? And Let's say Pine VPA, we implemented probably tens of different methods, right? So uh, at the end of the day, when you've got to publish something, right, what would you cite? First of all, you don't know what you've used, really. You kind of remember, maybe I've used meh, FSL. Uh, you cite FSL, right? Uh, I've used maybe Pine VPA, hmm? Da -da -da. maybe methods like Searchlight. But you wouldn't know details, right? You wouldn't know what I have to cite. And that was the problem where we've created due credit. Uh, it's almost like Dolce Gabbana, uh, Gabbana, right? We figured it out later. Okay, so why? Because our work is not cited adequately. And Gael Vrakwa, uh, that was our conflict. He says that this is social problem, right? And it must not be solved with technical terms. And then he just, every year, he just whines that, yes, again, 
you know, nobody cites the software. I think it's joint problem, right? It's social and technical. If it's easy to cite, yeah, why not, right? If it's allowed, I could click cite, right? Uh, so it's not only social. Sometimes we don't know what we've used. Let's say I've, you've used PyMVPA, you don't know what methods you've used for your analysis, right? And even ci if cited version information is often uh, omitted, right? So this provenance information. And absent visibility of contributors to existing projects fosters Prima Ballerina projects. What it means that I, I kept kind of repeating, contribute to existing projects, contribute to existing. But you're a PhD student, right? It's much better to put on your resume, I am the author of blah, blah, right? Because then everybody knows that you've created the majestic blah, blah, and they kind of respect you. If you contribute to some other project, eh. You know, nobody, you'll, you'll maybe say that you were contributed, but people wouldn't cite your work even though there is a publication. So that's the problem we are trying to solve. If you contribute to existing project and you annotate with your credit, then whoever uses your credit to collect citations, if they use your method, they will get the citation. And then they just embed in their paper. And in general, it's tedious to collect all those references and citations, right? So that was the, our hackathon project at OHBM 2015 with Mattel. So to make it very easy to collect references, to accumulate references as you go through the project, and also to get them formatted the way you want it. So here is an example, it's just one of the examples where we use SciPy, where we do some stupid clustering. And if you run it with due credit here, you see I do Python-M due credit, we get citations automatically, and not only for SciPy, but also for the cluster hierarchy linkage because we've used it. So we point not only to overall module, but to particular methods used in the, part, uh, in the, in the tool, right? Let's say if you run our uh, PyMVPA unit test for this uh, module, you'll get all kinds of references, right? Because we test SMLR, we test SVM, we collect all of them and present them for you. So you could just cut and paste and cite or just export it as VIP tag and then cite that way, okay? So uh, if you develop your software, and that's what many projects started to do, they start to support due credit by using uh, this recipe pretty much. You just annotate pieces of the code with your references and then people who would use due credit, they will get all those automatically. Uh, that's another example, fancy one. So just use it. Uh, if you are fancy in MATLAB and Octave, we could work together to provide MATLAB support, Java if anybody is still there, you know. And, um, and we need help, it's available in De uh, Mira Debian and we welcome contributions. So overall, summary, lessons learned. Uh, make sure that you could potentially share your data openly. Establish a very efficient code and data management, right? Test your analysis and assumptions, it's important. Reuse public data sets whenever you see that you know it's a data set a good fit, then you better use it instead of collecting your data. Or you might use it in addition to your data. If you made some finding, right? If you want to support your finding, take independent data set. You have already all the scripts probably, right? Just rerun it on that new data set if it fits the build kind of in, in terms of design and paradigm, and you'll provide the additional support. Uh, that's what we did in familiar faces study to investigate, or I forgot the name of the word. So we took independent data set and demonstrated that the network structure remains the same, even in the independent uh, data set. Um, then create your own shareable, legally virtualized, containerized uh, computational environments. Again, leg legal aspect is important. You could download some Docker image, but maybe at some point it would be removed, right? If somebody finds that it infringes somebody's copyright license, it might go and automate your analysis as much as possible. So not, if before you might have thought at the beginning of the talk that this is all utopian, hopefully now, right, you could say that it's all possible. So those with the symbols, uh, symbol of con, they're from our project and otherwise there is lots of other great resources out there to support um, these endeavors. Okay, so. Done. Any questions? Again, go home, start using. <laughs>
right? <laughs> Any of those.